hope your 2020 is off to a good start, at least above average. There's only been four or five. Is this the fifth day? January 5th? Wow. It's going by fast already. You know, one of the things I think is valuable for any person and is really a kind of a core value to me, one that I operate out of, is, self, is to be self-aware of the good and the bad. It's, it's really easy to not be self-aware when it comes to the things that aren't so good about yourself. But, and, and this is probably one of those things uh, that I will tell you that it can be difficult, I, it can be challenging for me to listen for an extended period of time to, to anything, even, but certainly to an individual uh, who is talking, whether that's somebody on a video or TV or any, even in person. It can be challenging, not that I don't do it, but it can be challenging to listen if, I, if, there, if, if what the subject's being spoken of is not really relevant to me. Now, I'm not talking about if you've been in my office for counseling uh, or anything like that. <laughs> Because you might say, well, none of that's relevant to you. But it's very relevant to me in a pastoral counseling setting. I'm just talking about if you meet somebody at the grocery store and they start rambling on about their, you know, their favorite hobby that is absolute. Or, you know, a distant relative that has no uh, pertinence to my life. Or it can be the, the, amount, the, the ability for me to take in and, and process information is directly correlated oftentimes to how relevant the information is to me. Now, let me say this. Because I know this is true of you too. And it is true when I stand up here and preach. Uh, you can listen politely, but be thinking about something entirely different. If what I'm speaking about has no perceived relevance to you. Now, I could also assume some stuff, right? I could say, well, I'm speaking about the Bible. It's relevant to you. That would be a bad assumption on my part. Yes, the Bible is relevant to you, but that doesn't mean you're listening to it as such. So, I say that because today I'm speaking about a word that sounds very religious and maybe even a little bit stuffy and could very well sound irrelevant to you. Maybe good is the best word you could assign to this other word that we're going to talk about, but I want to assure you of something. That as soon as I started preparing this message, I wrote at the top of my notes, make sure you work hard to establish the relevance or why this matters to the congregation. So we're going to talk about the word righteousness. Now, if we were going to talk about a word, I, I, I know, right? It's, it sounds important. I think it sounds important. Righteousness sounds important. Now, theologically, I know it's important. But I also know that some of you are thinking about the Chiefs and if they're going to lose in the first round, or I know that you're thinking about lunch, or you're thinking about, you're thinking about, I know the Cowboys didn't make it. I know that. I know you were thinking that. Um, I know a lot, that a lot of you probably didn't come to church going, you know what, honey, I hope he tells me why righteousness matters. I just hope we talk about righteousness today because I've been bothered by it. I, mean, just, I just, I know this. This is the challenge of a preacher that wants to preach in a relevant way. All right? So, and I do. So here's what we're going to do. I promise this. I will promise you that if you listen with attentiveness, you will see why righteousness truly does matter to your life. And not just in a far-off, eternal kind of sense, but in a day-to-day, -day, it matters and makes a difference on how I experience life since. So we're going to ask three questions, and if I don't answer them, I've, I've failed as a communicator. The first one is, what is righteousness? Because, you know, that's, that's not a safe assumption that we all are on the same page there. The second one is, why does it matter? And the third one is, how do I become a righteous person? So what is it? Why does it matter? And how do I become a righteous person? So you won't care about the answer to the third question if I don't answer the second question. The why does it matter, right? If, if it doesn't matter, then you probably don't care about how to become a righteous person. Here's another interesting fact, is many of you in this room are already righteous people, but you don't live in the awareness of your righteousness, which is like having a gold mine at your, at your fingertips that you never access, that you never live out of, that you never experience. That's how powerful and relevant righteousness and being a righteous person actually is. So in just a minute, I'm going to pray, but then we're going to talk about some words that we got to understand. And this could be heady, I know, but I think, I, you know, I personally find this pr profoundly uh, interesting. So if you are, uh, if you're interested because I'm interested, 
that's a good thing. And I learned that from my dad, and I taught biology 101 from my dad at East Texas State University. And they had a chalkboard that was probably, you know, at least half as long as this. And my dad was so excited about biology. Bless his heart. That's why they asked him to teach biology 101, because a lot of people that have to take that weren't interested in biology at all. They just had to take it. But my dad loved biology so much so that he would get excited and run from one side of the chalkboard to the other and write something down. And then he would turn around like this, like, isn't this excited? And I was like, I had no idea my dad loved biology this much, but he is. He's like getting a workout up there teaching biology. I love what we're going to talk about, and I want you to know I mean what I say, and I believe that it has profound relevance for your life. I really do. Would you pray with me? God, I will never be able to do this in my own strength. I'll never be able to speak in a way that matters if the power of your spirit does not guide me, inspire, and speak in and through me. And God, this amazing reality that, that many of us in this room share the same spirit of Jesus. And even with those that don't yet know Jesus in that way, your spirit will speak to them and move in their lives. And so we pray for clarity. We pray for um, insight and understanding. And help us to see this matter as it really is, truly as it is, and how important righteousness really is to our lives. So, Father, help us to wipe away the cobwebs and the things that would distract us and the things that would call for our attention in another direction and help us to focus in closely to, the, to, this, uh, to this message and what you want to say to us through it. We trust you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, a couple of words I think that are important for us to understand. We're in Romans chapter 4 and verses 1 through 8. Romans chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. So find that in your Bibles. Um, and we are going through, if you're not aware, we've been going through the book of Romans for several months. And we're going to work our way all the way through it. This is about, we're starting in about a third of the way through. Here, not quite a third of the way. Um, but there's a lot ahead of us, is, is, should, is what I should say. And... A lot of it builds, a lot of Romans builds together, but uh, even in today, and if you've not heard one of the messages, this, this really can stand alone for you and, um, in terms of, of understanding what's going on. Here's, here's what Paul says in Romans chapter, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Would you stand today? Let's just, uh, again, become aware that we're reading um, anything but something, that we're reading something that's profoundly relevant. Oftentimes we find ourselves reading things that aren't so relevant on social media and things, and so standing will help us recognize that. Here's what the scripture says in Romans chapter 4, first eight verses. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those, here's what he wrote, Psalm 32, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and those and whose sins have been covered, blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. God, again, this is your word. We recognize and yield to it right now. With everything we know how to do that, we do that. We want to subject ourselves to the, to the authority and the power that is inherent in your word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. A couple words that are important. The first one really is justified. So there's, there's justified and righteousness. You're going to see how those two words are really tied together and why they matter that you understand both of them. Justified means to render something. To render it means to make it, but cause it to be so. To render or make to be as one ought to be. Have you ever thought of righteousness as that? Uh, or justif justification as that? As to, to, be, to make you as you ought to be. To return you to the condition that you were meant to be in. To declare, it means to declare or pronounce a person, one, to be justified. And that means before God. I'm justified. I am okay to be before God. Now that is important to realize because you can't just go before God. I mean, if you could think of that like uh, even, even if you were going before um, a high po world power, you would, you would feel somewhat... I think most of us would naturally feel somewhat 
uh, maybe intimidated, like uh, I'm out of my league here kind of thing. And, and that, in a small way, represents how we naturally cannot just go before God. We're not, we're not made to be in His presence, but justification puts us in that condition as we ought to be. So we're justified to be before God as, as we ought to be. If we're going to be in God's presence, justified is how we have to be in His presence. So that's what that word means. And then righteousness, righteousness, and they have the same root, uh, dikaio, and, and it's the, the righteousness is the state. It's, the, it's like water is, the, is a state, uh, and ice is a state of water, if you could say that. Righteousness is the state of a person who is as they ought to be. It's the condition that results from being justified. So if you're justified, that means you've been declared or made to be righteous. It's the condition that's acceptable to God. So justified is a verb. Righteousness is a noun or a descriptive uh, terminology of the state that you're in. Okay? So it's important to understand those. And, and maybe to boil it down and make it really kind of simple, justified simply means that you have been made right with God, so you can be before God, and, and righteousness describes that condition. It describes the condition or the result of righteousness. So, so righteousness being the result of justification. Now, I think that there is a common false narrative. Something that we, a false narrative is something we tell ourselves that's not true. But a narrative being something we've repeated to ourselves. It's almost like a, a storyline, right? So a common false narrative many of us believe is that righteousness has little to no real impact on how we live or experience life. You may not think that, per se. You may not run that line through your brain. But when you hear the word, your response to it indicates that belief. When you, when you hear somebody talk about righteousness, or you, maybe you read about it in a devotion, you don't connect it to the quality of your life. You don't understand that there's a real connection and a vibrant reality that comes alive or can come alive in a, a life of a righteous person or someone who's living in, in a righteous state. So that, that is a false narrative. Is basically says that righteousness doesn't really matter. Maybe it's something God you know, likes or approves of, or maybe it's something theologians get excited about, but why should you be excited? So let's, let's um, walk through uh, the, these first eight verses of chapter 4 to get a really clear picture of what Paul is and what Paul is not saying uh, about, about righteousness. But we, in order to do that, we have to back up to Romans 3, verse 28. So to get a running start at it, he says this, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith. That's his premise. That's what Paul's arguing. We maintain, we hold that a man, that a person is made right with God by faith apart from works of the law. So he is saying this. We believe, but he's establishing this truth that righteousness, becoming righteous, is not something that you can earn. It is something that is given to you by God. So that's what he says. We maintain that a man is justified return to the condition as they ought to be before God, they're justified apart from works. So that is, you're not made right with God by the good things that you do. That there's, there's no amount of good things, good works that you can do that will all of a sudden earn you the status of righteous before God. There's not. That's what he's saying. That's what we're establishing, Paul says. So then you go to verse, verse uh, chapter 4 and verse 1, and he, he's fleshing that premise out. So he calls a powerful witness to the stand, so to speak. He starts off with somebody almost everybody has heard of inside and outside the church. And that person is Abraham. And so he asks this question. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? Has found as far as what? As far as righteousness. What is Abraham? What can we learn from Abraham? Abraham, you, if he could, call him. You come forward and you tell us what you have found. And, and so the question then becomes, what does Abraham tell us? So Paul's asking this. Um, what can we discover from a comment? Now he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. He's kind of bringing them all together in the Roman church. And he has, he has this credible voice that speaks across the spectrum. And he says, if Abraham finds out that a person was justified by the law, 
then I guess we have a problem here with my argument. But if Abraham didn't, then we can go forward with it. And so he basically says this in verse 2. He says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So, did Abraham find out that he could boast before God? No, Abraham didn't. And he's talking about when God, when God called Abraham and said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Abraham was an old man. His wife was an old lady. They were well past childbearing years, but God gave them this promise. And it was Abraham's belief, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, Abraham believing that promise that God gave him. Actually, it's better to say that Abraham believed God, and that belief, the Bible says, was credited to Abraham as righteousness. So it wasn't his works that made Abraham a righteous person. It was his beliefs. Verse 3 says this. For what does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. So he asked the reader to think about Abraham, right? He leads us to the scripture that gives them the clear answer to the question that he asked. And he says, Abraham discovered this. That believing God, that faith in God is what God credits to our account as righteousness. It's what results in righteousness. Now, your tendency and mine, our default setting, is, is to think and to function like righteousness is an achievement. That's why we say, oh, uh, they think of themselves as so righteous. And that's a derogatory statement, right? No one thinks, you know, we don't say that as a compliment. Um, or self-righteous, meaning the same thing. They are self-righteous. They deem themselves to be righteous. Or another term that kind of fits with that is holier than thou. And so this term, righteous, carries a lot of baggage for us today. And it's usually not good baggage. So Paul's undoing that for us by saying, look at what Abraham discovered. Abraham discovered that God credited him with righteousness as a result of what? Not works, but believing God. And I think it's important that we, we leave that little word, and I'm probably going to mess that up at times, but not believing in God or not necessarily believing what God says. But I think there's a, there's a value in saying that Abraham believed God, kind of unilaterally. Like, God says that I trust God. I believe God. Not believe in the fact that God is there. Not just believe what God said, but I believe. I put my belief in God. Now, that word belief is pistuo, and it, means, it actually means to trust that God is able. To trust God to be able. So if, if somebody says, do you believe in God? If you're going to answer that in a true biblical sense, what you're saying is, I trust God to be able. And we might want to respond with a question. What do you mean by believe in God? I believe God, or I, be I trust God to be able to do what? In this sense, is to make a person righteous. Can God just deem you? Can God transform you? Can God make you righteous, right with him? Because the other natural condition that is, we all deal with is we know we are not right with God. I mean, we would have to be in a delusional state to think apart from anything just in our natural condition that you're right with God. That you could stand before God and say, I'm a good person. We inherently know that we are not that, right? No, I, I, I've never found somebody, again, in clear mental faculties, functioning well, would say that. They say, yeah, I'm, I'm just fine to go before God. I'm not scared to stand before God just as I am. I don't need an advocate. I don't need an explanation. I'm just good enough. No one says that. We know inherently that we are not righteous. We know that in our own condition, we aren't there. And the, the, the deal is this. We need to be. We desperately need to be. So, he says, when we believe, pistuo, we trust God to be able. There's another word that's mattered, that matters. It's the word credited. He says, when Abraham believed God, he credited, it was credited to him as righteousness. Don't you love when you look at your bank account and something's credited to your bank account? We like that rather than taken out. And I like that our bank always puts that in green. I don't know why green is a calming color. It's assuring. When you look at and something's been credited, means to be put back in or put into your account. And it's versus debited, <laughs> it's taken out of your account. And the Bible says here that when Abraham believed God, it was put into his account. It was credited him as righteousness. It was the same. And the word actually means that it carries the same weight as righteousness. It is righteousness. It, it, it matters there. To reckon, it means to reckon, to compute something to be. 
to, to cause this transaction to be equal, concluded to be equivalent to something. So his faith was equivalent to righteousness. God transacted it as such. He reckoned his account as such that when Abraham believed him, he was righteous. That's what made him. That's what was credited to him, the Bible says, as righteousness. That's very different than how you naturally think. That's very different than how I naturally think. And, and by the way, everybody, you just listen to people, everybody's kind of working on this. We don't really think of it oftentimes just in the everyday flow of life as working on righteousness, but we would prefer to think of ourselves as more of a good person than a bad person. Well, where are we measuring that from? Where, where does that measure come from? It, it ultimately comes from the hearkening and the reckoning of ourselves before God because we want to be right. There is something still inherit in your spirit and your soul that wants that desperately knows it needs to be right with God you can't find people who naturally again the mental faculties are working well you can't find people who are just okay to have it all out of balance to say well no I'm more bad than good they may admit that but that's not a good place for them to be no one feels good about that we are naturally desirous to be righteous to be right with God to have the account reckoned before God, credit to us, if we have to have it so, as such. But most of us are trying to still work for it. Even those who have placed their faith in Jesus for ultimate salvation, to trust Him to forgive our sin and to, and to help us bridge the gap of hell to heaven. Uh, we still can believe, somehow we do this, we believe all of that, but in, in, in day-to-day life we, we try to earn righteousness. And Paul is working very hard here in Romans chapter 4 to say, no, 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 no. It's, you, there's a righteousness that is established for you. The way you can become right with God that is apart from it has nothing to do with your performance, with your works. Because if we were to look into your account today, or if we were to look into my account today, there's way more debits than credits. There's way more that I owe than, than I possess in terms of goodness or being right with God I'm upside down if you will and we all are but we don't like that that's not the condition we want to be in that's your soul wants to be inverted and made right it's that's what your soul longs for that's why you're pursuing what you're pursuing you may not know that but that's that's what's the driving your life so so Paul points to Abraham as this high example of righteousness through belief or trust in God and not through works. Look at verses 4 and 5. He says, Now, the one who works, think of it as working for righteousness, all right? The one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor. If you work for something, you earn it. It's not a favor. It's not a gift. And he says, but it's, it's, it's what's due. And then he says, but to the one who does not work, parenthetically for their righteousness the one who's not working but 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 instead that person believes in him who justifies the ungodly Isn't that an awesome phrase that's that's the call that's the means of righteousness believe in him who justifies who makes right the ungodly that person his or her faith is credited just like Abraham as righteousness it Abraham was credited as righteousness when when he believed that God could do what he said he would do and that God was faithful to himself and God was faithful to his word. That is exactly how you and I become righteous today. Is we still take God as we still believe that God is a faithful God to his word. We believe that what he said is true. We believe God is true. So if a person works and receives payment for that work, when you work this week and you get a paycheck as a result, you've earned that. That's not a gift. You don't say, my employer gave me a gift this week. They put a paycheck into my account. That's not a gift. You earned that, right? But if someone sends you a card for your birthday and it has $50 in it, uh, you, don't, you don't say, well, I earned that. I live to be, you know, whatever age. You didn't earn it. That was a gift. They, they, they gave you more than you deserved because you didn't earn that, okay? So that's how he's talking about that. In the case of the person who does not try to achieve their own righteousness by good works, in that case, but instead they believe, they, they trust God to be able to make them righteous, they believe in Jesus, 
And he is the one who justifies the ungodly to that person, to you, not just Abraham. It is credited into your account before God as being right. You are returned to the condition before God that you ought to be in. The problem that we have there is that we don't often, sometimes our feelings don't line up with that reality because we're still keeping account of our failures and our, and our successes. But, you know, from time to time you'll hear a person say, well, I'm more good than bad. And they, you know, if you're talking to a person who doesn't know Jesus, they will often, you know, they'll evaluate their account and they'll look at their debits and their credits and they'll say, well, I have more credits, I think. And it's their own evaluation, right? God's not saying it. But it's their own evaluation. I think I am more good than bad. If you were to put my good on one side and my bad on one side, I think they would say, I think my good outweighs my bad. And therefore, they're saying, I think that justifies me before God. The problem is, is that God's not looking for more good than bad. That's not what justifies a person. God's looking for good with no bad. Right? So that leaves us hopeless. I mean, if, if righteousness matters, and we're going to look at that, then that leaves us hopeless because no one, no one in the right mind has ever said to me in 49 years, I am perfectly good without God. That is, I have no, no sin. Everybody would admit, and there's at least, well, no, no one would even admit that, that we're, we're racked with sin. We are plagued by sin. But we can't, we can't, we can't balance the account. It's never going to, it has to be given to us. And dependence on Jesus is credited, it's the only thing that will credit your account and credit you before God, transform you before God, and make you righteous. So look at verses 6 through 8, and then let's work hard to get to the point of why this so desperately matters to us. He says, just as David also speaks of the blessings on the man to whom God credits righteousness, God credits righteousness, you didn't earn it, we didn't earn it, they didn't earn it, God credits it apart from works. He says, that to the, here's the condition, and this is, speaks to why it matters. Here's the condition of that person. Blessed are those who law, whose lawless deeds have been covered over, have been hidden by God. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. He blots it out. He, he removes the indebtedness. And, and what does that? What causes God to cover the sin, to, to remove the indebtedness, Faith in Jesus, dependence on Jesus. Only that, belief, the same thing that justified Abraham justifies you. Now let's do this. What does it mean? Let's look at practically every day. What does it mean for you and for me to be a righteous person? Now, I will honestly tell you that if somebody sat down with me, uh, you know, a few years ago and said, uh, what does it mean to be a righteous person? I would have probably given them a definition that sounded not so attractive in the in terms of the kind of life that it was it would it would have been in about a few years I probably mean about like 20 I, I'm, I'm a little ways past this but but what I'm talking about is that I would have probably described a person who followed the rules I would have probably described a person who was largely a rule follower and a religious rule follower a, a church rule follower and who who tried to, to do more good than bad and it would have sounded a lot like works it really would have. But that's not at all what Paul is describing. So, first, in the most basic understanding of being a righteous person is understanding that person to be a person whose sin has been graciously and completely covered by God. If you are a righteous person, you are a forgiven person. And, and it doesn't mean tolerated. Forgiven means blotted out, erased. I mean, look at the work of Jesus on the cross. And do you think he just skated by on forgiveness? I mean, the death of a perfect person for sinful people. I mean, he overwhelmingly conquered your sin debt. He didn't, you know, if you, if you think of it like this, if you owed $100, didn't, Jesus didn't just put $101 into your account. It, it, there were millions and trillions of dollars. It overwhelmingly paid the debt. I mean, it was not just a little sufficient. When you're dealing with guilt from sin, when you're still racked with shame, you need to know your account has been credited. You have been made righteous when you place your faith and confidence in Jesus in an overwhelming way. You cannot find your sin. It's been buried by the good works of Jesus. It's been covered over by... You don't have any business dealing with shame 
and guilt. You don't have to go to work. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to go into a relationship feeling like the dredge of society. You don't have to carry around the weight of guilt and brokenness of past failures. None of that is counted towards you. You are free from that. You've been declared righteous, and I mean overwhelmingly so. I'm telling you, it does matter. The, Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, if, if anyone... If anyone is in Christ, they have believed, they transfer their trust, that person, he or she, is a new creature. That's what Paul says, you are a new creature. The old things have passed away. That little, I mean, your sin that so desperately broke you and left you separated from God has been overwhelmingly conquered by the grace and the goodness and the mercy of God it's been wiped away. The old things have passed away. Behold, stand and look. New things have come. One of the deep needs of the church today is for Christians to realize you have a newness at, at your fingertips to live out of. I mean, the guilt-free, shame-free, good life that God has placed before you to step into, and it's the life of righteousness. New things have come. You're not the same kind of person you were before your sin was forgiven. You are not, don't ever buy the bumper sticker. If you've got it on your car, you've got to take it off today. Uh, Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. That is bad, bad theology. It's not true. You're not just forgiven. You're not just imperfect, but, oh, but I'm, I'm forgiven before my mistakes. I'll just keep on doing them. But I keep on being forgiven. It's kind of a give and take. Eh, you know, he just slid us over a little bit. No, no, you were a wreck. You were under the wrath of God, the Bible says. You were an object of wrath. And now you are a dearly, deeply loved child of God, permanently etched into the eternal family of Jesus, an heir of the kingdom you are not just forgiven. No way. No way. You rip that bumper sticker, not off other people's cars, just yours, okay? <laughs> you see people go through Walmart parking lot, rip. Bad theology. <laughs> Theft. <laughs> well, I stole bad theology, okay? Don't do that. Just your own, just your own. No guilt and shame if you got it on there, right? Because you are righteous. You're just wrong if you got that bumper sticker on there. You can be righteous and wrong. I'm that a lot. Don't tell anybody I said that. My family doesn't know that I'm wrong every now and then. I tell them I'm right, always. I have it etched in stone. It's sitting on my little night table. I think Kelly put it in the drawer, though. <laughs> I come by it honestly. It was my dad's. It said once I thought I was wrong, but I was mistaken. not true I've been wrong a lot Paul asked this question also in in first Corinthians 6 19 he said do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you do you know that's what I mean if you looked at the physicality of it the tangibility of righteousness it is the fact that there is a real living spirit of Jesus in you it's not your righteousness you didn't earn it right it was gifted to you it's Jesus it's implanted in you. You are righteous. Your soul has been made righteous. You're transformed. You are a new person. So why? I think we've answered some of that, but why should I want to become a righteous person? And there's a couple of ways that we can answer that question, I think. And the most common response would be likely be that you, you should want to become a righteous person because that means your sins are forgiven and you're no longer an object of, wrath, of the wrath of God. That's a true statement. That's an important statement. Because sin being forgiven is a very important thing. And, and justification, uh, being just before God, is, is vastly uh, probably undervalued and not taught and preached. Uh, and not being under the wrath of God. Wow, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. We just don't think about it very often. The focus of that motivation, though, if that's what motivates us, is about avoiding wrath. And while we desperately want to, and it is necessary, I don't know that that is always our greatest, the thing that Jesus even taught, motivates a person to live in a righteous way. Um, that singular motivation is almost always leaves us short of experiencing all 
It's about avoiding and not entering into. I'm avoiding the penalty, but God has called us to enter into a life of righteousness. And so I, I think that, that, that maybe that motivation is something uh, short. It's correct, it's the right direction, but it's short of. And, and being forgiven of sin is only the beginning of being a righteous person. That's only, uh, it becomes, that allows you, that affords you, that makes it possible for you to enter into a life of righteousness. You don't just have to take the stamp and say, I'm righteous, I'm declared just before God. Now you can live out of that, right? Like you could say, it's, it's the same thing as someone said, hey, I'm putting a million dollars into your bank account. You could say, I'm a millionaire. But what if you never, ever tapped into that, that financial resource? You could say you're a millionaire, but it's how would it benefit you if you never utilized it or lived in light of it or resulted in it? invest it, whatever you want to do. But if you just had it there, you could say, yes, I possess it. It's, it's mine. It's, it's my money. I have it. But you, you, know, you just continued maybe to have credit card debt and live just like you always live, but you have all the... That's what happens. I mean, God declares you righteous, but now you're called to live out of that righteousness, to tap into that account, to, to live because of it and in light of it. So this matter of righteousness can't be regarded or thought of as just an optional way to live or as having no real value for your life. If we think of righteousness like a, you know, a nice title or, or something maybe precious and valuable that, that we have but it doesn't really bear down on our lives, then, then it just, it's just going to remain irrelevant to you. And I, I would hold to you with all the vigor and all the authenticity that I have that righteousness has tremendous bearing on how you live your life today and tomorrow and the next day. The quality of it, the nature, the power, the peace, the joy, righteousness is, is, is man, that's the heart of the matter. Being right with God and living out of that account. And he's saying that's a gift, not something you've earned, right? So, does becoming a righteous person have any real or desirable impact on the kind of person you are and how you live and experience life in John 3.36, Jesus said it did. Listen to how he said it. And this is what he's speaking to. This is what Jesus' motivation to living out of a righteous life is, is saying. He said, he who believes the Son, look at how he says that. He who believes, not just believes in, but he who believes, you know, it actually does say believe in the Son. Some translations did say just believes the Son. Has, has eternal life. Possesses eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son, equating belief and obedience, will not see life, not enter into the eternal kind of life. But the wrath of God remains on that person. And I'm just telling you right there, Jesus said, righteousness, being made righteous by believing in the Son, results in, in, uh, in an eternal kind of life. And not believing, not entering, not being declared righteous through faith in Jesus, leaves you as a, an object of the wrath of God. And everybody who is without Jesus is squirming under the weight of that reality. No, we don't recognize it as such, but we're constantly measuring the scales, trying to find what an eternal kind of life offers, but we're looking for it in places we cannot find it. So eternal life, listen, eternal life is not just talking about the duration with, uh, that you will exist. Okay, you need to hear this. When you say, do you have eternal life, you're not just talking about something that starts when you die and then never ends. It does speak to the duration. Certainly it is a life that never ends. But it also, and even just as much, speaks to the kind of life you live. So Dallas Willard correctly describes it as the eternal kind of life, which begins the moment you are justified before God through faith in the one who justifies the ungodly. That eternal kind of life is yours. That happens when you are made righteous as a result of justification. Justification is your, your standing before God has been made right. You've been returned to the right position and declared righteous. Your account has been credited as righteous. And now you live out of that. Jesus said in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And you really can say that as has the eternal kind of life. And they, that person does not, look at what you don't have now. That person does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. 
guilt and shame is driving humanity. Listen, we operate out of it. If you don't have righteousness, if you've not become a righteous person through confidence in Jesus, guilt and shame and brokenness is driving your life. You are functioning out of that reality. It's the only reality you have is to live whether you call it, whatever you call it, but the Bible calls it as an object of wrath, of God's wrath. You live under the crushing weight of guilt and shame. And all he says here is, hey, this transaction can be reconciled. Have you ever had a point where uh, you got overdrafted in your account? No, no one ever has done that. And I'm speaking theoretically, okay? <laughs> I'm not. Not recently, but this has happened where you get upside down in your account and then overdraft fees hit, right? And so it compounds. You may have only been over you may you may have only been overdrafted by two dollars, but then it hits you with a thirty dollar overdraft which makes you more overdrafted and, and more upside down. And then another one comes through is so you get another thirty dollars. So a five dollar debit costs you thirty five dollars. And that can it can get you upside down real quick. That is a terrible thing to look at your account and to see all those red and negative signs before numbers it just sends you into a panic. I mean, it's a terrible way to financially exist, right? To owe more than you have. That is your spiritual, listen to me, that's your spiritual condition before God without Jesus. If you have not been declared righteous through confidence in Jesus, you are upside down and it is spiraled out of control. It is nothing you can get hold of. So you turn in your desperate brokenness to Jesus. I'm telling you, righteousness and living out of it matters. It, is a, it goes from horrid darkness to beautiful light and hope and peace. Let me speak briefly to this so we have adequate time for our communion service. But how do you become a righteous person? If, you, if you're sitting here saying, I, you know, I'm religious, I've been to church, I, I've called myself a Christian even, but I don't know that I've ever been declared righteous by God through faith in Jesus. Well, it just answered my question. You become a righteous person when you trust Jesus to be able to make you righteous. And you stop trusting yourself. You stop trying to earn your account back into the positive because you can't. It is simply a throwing up of your hands and saying, I've sinned and I've made the, my account before God so desperately broken that I could never fix it unless somebody comes to my rescue. And I owe this, I owe all this stuff. And God says, I'll forgive all that debt. I'll wipe it out. I'll cover it over. And you say, what do I got to do for that? Do I have to go to church every single day of the year? Do I have to start giving money? What do I got to do? Start memorizing scripture? Got to start, stop cussing and start using Bible words? What do I got to do? I'll do that. And he says, Let's take care of all that later, and let's just focus right now. The one thing you need to do is, is to place your confidence in Jesus. Confidence for what? Confidence that He can make you righteous. That He can gift you with that. That He can credit your account before God. Trust Him to do that. And then that means you will trust Him to show you how to live your life. Will you do that? Would you be willing to surrender to Jesus in that way? And yield the authority of your life to Him? If you've never done that today is the best possible day to do that one thing. Christian, let me not leave you without this admonition. Is your Christianity marked by a hope for heaven someday, but a present reality that looks a lot like your unchristian friends? That's a real important question. Is your Christianity marked by a someday hope that I will die and go to heaven, and that's the sum total of it. I mean, that's what you got out of it. But right now, you exist and feel and experience and do life much like people who know nothing about Jesus. The same anxiety, same problems, same values, same condition of your family relationship, same everything. You just, and then, so you're the, you're the person that's going to get the bumper sticker and say, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. That's all I got on you. And I'd get on my knees and beg you to realize how desperately wrong that is. That's not all you got. God has put righteousness into your account. And you are righteous. You're not upside down before him anymore. 
And you can live out of that account. You can tap into it. You can make withdrawals. And the cool thing about it, don't you wish this worked financially, is it never depletes. You live out of righteousness, you have it. You live, you have it. Rightness with God. Would you, Christian, the world needs you to live out of that. Don't drag around guilt and shame and indebtedness that it's not yours anymore. Jesus took it. And he stamped and declared you and made you righteous forever. I don't know what your response needs to be to that, but today I'm just going to ask you to stay seated, and I'm going to pray for you to make the right response to that, that God's Spirit would meet you in your chair, and that you would know, man, I, I, need to, I need to trust Jesus today for the very first time in a way that I, my account's credited. I'm tired of living upside down. I'm tired of guilt. I'm tired of shame. I need to trust Jesus today. And maybe you go, I, I am a Christian. I was always thinking that was about just heaven someday. And you're telling me that it means I can live a righteous life, the eternal kind of life from now on until I die and then after? Yes, I'm telling you that. That's not what I'm telling you, actually. That's what the Scripture says with absolute clarity. You don't have to live like somebody who's not been made righteous anymore. So let's pray and ask God to do that. Father, you, as the song says, are truly a good good father and that's not just a simple term it means there is nothing bad nothing that is dark nothing that is wrong with you your love for me and for every person in this room is perfect and we are going to cast ourselves on perfect love today for the person who's never trusted Jesus never found righteousness credited to their account through confident reliance on Jesus. And may that happen today by the work of your spirit in their life, drawing them to faith, giving them that confidence, showing them their need, bringing them to brokenness. God, you do all of that and, and, and help them to step forward into that, to place faith in Jesus. Father, for just as great a need today in the church is for righteous people to live no longer like they are beggars. No longer like their count is upside down, but they would begin to live out of the wealth of righteousness that you have credited to our account before you. That we'd be free, that we would have joy, that we would have peace, that we'd have proper priorities, that we'd do life like you've called us to do life in dependence and obedience to Jesus. And it is a good and beautiful life you have ordained for us. These things I ask in Jesus' great name. Amen.